and welcome to St. Brendan's Episcopal Church in Juneau, Alaska for the sixth Sunday of Easter. With me, I'm the Reverend Carolyn Mulsey, I'm the priest in charge here, and with me are Stephanie Hall, who is our pianist and reader, Stephanie McDermott, who is our violist and reader and soloist, and Dan Hall, who is our camera operator. Our opening hymn is Now the Green Blade Riseth. Shown in the sight of the nations. 
He remembers his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the heart, with the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the lands and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. In righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The first reading is a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us say together, Canticle 17. Lord, Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from John. Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to so lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if, I do, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Love one another. Many of the Johannine reading, writings and before those Paul's and the, other, and the other evangelists focus on love. After a while, love one another begins to sound trite, tiresome, even syrupy. We know, we know we're supposed to love one another. Of course we are to love one another. We all want to love and be loved. The biblical love is deeper and more profound than the Hallmark card. Look at the world that John lived in, the world in which he proclaimed the message of Jesus in the early church. Love was not the prevailing value of the time. Of course, Jesus and John's community emerged from the Jewish tradition. That tradition, we know, primarily focused on law. 
Certainly the Hebrew people knew that God loved them and that they were to relate to one another in a manner called hesed, loving kindness. <clears throat> I think we can say, though, that the law served as the nuclear glue that held together Jewish life, thinking, and religious practice. John's community lived in Greece, and Greece, as we know, had a strong philosophical tradition. In the first century, the foremost Greek philosopher was Epictetus, who I did not pronounce properly, a former slave and a cripple who taught about the primacy of self-knowledge, choice, and reason. He says comparatively little about love. Also current in John's world in the Egypt and elsewhere was the Christian movement of Gnosticism. The name of that movement comes from the word gnosis, knowledge. This movement taught that salvation came through secret knowledge imparted by Jesus to a select few. And that rather than sharing this knowledge broadly, it was to be restricted to a small group who were de de deemed worthy and ready to receive this knowledge. Much of what we knew about Gnosticism until the 1950s came from the critiques of other writers. But this discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed many of their texts. Gnostics focused on sacred, secret knowledge rather than love. We know that John was aware of their teaching as their dualistic thinking of darkness and light, good and evil, do find their way into his writings. But his imparting of Jesus' message of love is very different from their secret society. Then, of course, there was the Roman Empire, the overwhelming force in John's time. The empire, as we know, was less interested in love than it was by controlling the world through power, dominance, force, and violence. So Jesus' teachings about love conveyed through Paul, the evangelists, and John, far from being prosaic and mundane and old and maybe boring, were a fresh new breeze breathing through the first century. Other religions and cultures certainly knew and practiced love, but Jesus' message of love is a prime directive, apologies to Gene Roddenberry, was a new thing. Tacitus would later say in wonder, see these Christians, how they love one another. Love in the early church was not simply an emotion, philia, person-to-person -person attraction. Christian love was agape, active, selfless behavior that sought the good of the other. We see it in action in the stories in Paul, Acts, and elsewhere. Paul taking up a collection in the communities outside Jerusalem to assist the poor in that sacred city. Groups of Christians that lived together and shared all their possessions in common. Groups of Christians that lived together, excuse me, deacons and deaconesses like Phoebe and Stephen appointed to minister to widows, poor people, and others in need. Even worship culminated in a sacred meal that, after the bread and wine were blessed and shared, looked more like a potluck dinner, with everyone present being fed and enjoying fellowship. Paul did have to remind the more privileged to leave some for latecomers, but it's clear that worship events served as a time for agape, to care for one another. These behaviors, these customs, seemed seemingly mild-mannered and just nice. We're more than that. Love practiced in this way 
confronted the world in, in which the Christian community lived. Love was more than a philosophy focused on individual self-knowledge and virtue. Love of this kind did originate in the Hebrew tradition, and but it called the Christian's Jewish neighbors back to their own history and tradition and teaching of Hesed. Love exceeded the notion of a select secret community with the goal that only its members would achieve salvation. Love expands on itself to draw others in. And love as a primary teaching confronted and subverted and offended the Roman adulation of power and privilege. Nothing was more threatening to a dominant power than, a small, than small communities here and there gathering to celebrate a Savior who demonstrated by his self-sacrifice, by his death and resurrection, most of all by his message of love, the impotence of even the most organized and threatening culture on earth. Love in the early Christian world took courage. It meant living in a way that some despised, some mocked, and that threatened the powers of the time. When we see Paul demanding his rights as a Roman citizen in court and releasing prisoners from their cells, we see love in action. When we see, as we saw last week, Stephen baptizing a stranger whose very body offended the norms of the Judeo-Christian culture, we see profound and courageous love. When we see Jesus and later the disciples incorporating Samaritans, crippled people, people who were mentally ill perhaps, women and other excluded dismissed groups into their community, we see brave love, love with vision that expanded on the norms and assumptions of the time. St. Brendan's has a tradition of practicing the agape kind of love. It's something that we take a little pride in, we enjoy, we feel good about. Welcoming folks into our home for a meal and more importantly perhaps fellowship has identified us in the community as practitioners of love. Reaching out to kids at the Johnson Youth Center. Providing bedding to housing first. Giving folks at the Pioneer home a chance for artistic expression. Giving kids an opportunity to learn to express themselves through music. Most recently, even yesterday, hosting vaccine clinics that offered immunity to COVID to 80 people in a convenient, friendly, cozy atmosphere. We do the love thing here. And it brings us joy. As Jesus said, so that our joy may be complete. But we can't rest on our laurels. We are called to some scarier, braver kinds of love in a hurting world. In a time when racism and xenophobia seem to be growing like hotcakes in our culture, we need to develop relationships with our native Asian, black, and Jewish neighbors and learn how we can support them and advocate for them in an oppressive world. That would be a deep and radical form of love. In a time when women experience violence, and it seems to be accepted among so many, we need to reach out to women who are abused and denied opportunity for improving their lives and the lives of their families, and learn how we can help them build their lives in the ways that feel right to them. That would be compassionate and practical love. 
in a time when stresses are increasing and people are struggling with them. We need to seek out folks who are struggling with depression, anxiety, psychosis, dementia, addiction, and do what we can to help them find comfort and peace of mind. That would be holy and healing love. Love, love, love. It's more than a Beatles song or a Hallmark card. But let me close with a quote from Rogers and Hammerstein, which may seem sappy, but I've always found rings with truth. It's from The Sound of Music, where Maria counsels Liesel on her first crush. She says, love in your heart isn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. Agape isn't love till we give it away. But when we do, our neighbors are changed, our world is changed, we are changed, and our joy becomes more complete. Love one another. Amen. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed, on page 7 in your leaflets if you have them. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way go. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create, create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, you prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God of heavenly powers, by the might of your command, you drive away from our bodies all sickness and all infirmity. Be present in your goodness with those who are ill, especially those affected by the coronavirus, that their weakness may be banished and their strength restored, and that their health being renewed, they may bless your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, 
for the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. And since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you, and you in me, in this life, and in the life to come. Amen. And because today is Mother's Day, I'm going to read for you a prayer from the prayer book, slightly adapted. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the joy and care of children. Give to all who care for them, mothers and other caregivers, calm strength and patient wisdom as we bring them up, that we may teach them to love whatever is just and true and good, following the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our offering today is given to us by the two Stephanies. Our loose offering today will go to the Glory Hall. Stewardship is a vital expression of our faith, as well as a practical necessity for the church. Our giving reminds us that we do not live for ourselves alone, but for God and one another. If you wish to send in an offering, please send it to St. Brendan's at 4207 Mendenhall and Road, Juneau, Alaska, 99801.
bearers of the people are formed too. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishop Mark, our Archdeacon Mark, and Caroline, our priest in charge, and Michael, our deacon, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the Diocese of Alaska and make us one. We pray for Christ Church and Vic. Pray for the Church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray for Robert, Herb, Arlen, Mark, Mike, David, Diana, Duffy, Colleen, David, Jeffrey, Cindy, Hector, Anne, Bill and Janet, Stephen and Kathy, Ashu, Yerus, Aaron and Devon, Dwayne, Constance, Dave, Nicole, Marsha, Pat, Faith, Holly, Troy, Cheryl, John, Lori, Paul, Carl, Sherry A, Jane, Jerry, Mary Rose, Don A, Jackie, Jordan, Jeremy, Julie, Jonathan. For all those on the front lines dealing with the coronavirus, and those suffering from it, victims of domestic violence, all who live and work at the Johnson Youth Center and Juno Youth Services Homes, all who live with addictions and those who love and care for them, all around the world who suffer from AIDS or Alzheimer's, and all who look for a cure. And I especially ask your prayers for the people in the nation of India. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially Mary. I ask your thanksgiving for our church family, especially Chuck and Carla Adams and family, Provincia in India, and those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace for the hope of glory. And we pray give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Our closing hymn is One Bread, One Body.
bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. <laughs>